Greetings. Welcome to the Dragon Con Urban Fantasy Track author interview series. I'm the director of the track, Carol Malcolm, and I am joined tonight by the fabulous, uh, multi talented, and multi genre author, Sherry Priest. Sherry, thank you so much for being here this, uh, this wonderful evening. And uh, yes, well, I'm, I'm thrilled to see you again. And uh, we look forward to it being in person at some point in time. But this is better than nothing, I will say. Soon, so, soon. And I, I very much appreciate you doing this. Um, my first question is basically the same one that I ask every person that I have done one of these author interviews with. And that is, did you read fantasy or sci-fi as a child or a young adult? Did you start out? That at that age, I'm I'm pretty sure you've heard this story at some point. I probably have, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but the answer is broadly no. Um, so to to make a very long story short, uh, my parents divorced when I was about five, and uh, my sister and I lived with my mother, and my mother was an evangelical fundamentalist who had decided that anything that uh, was not literature or Christian fiction was not allowed in her home. Um, so I, it, it, like, I, to give you some example of how serious she was about this, when I was about, I would have been about eight or nine, I guess, uh, my dad took me to the library and I discovered Nancy Drew. And I thought that was the coolest thing. It's a girl, yeah, older than me, but a girl, you know. Right, yeah. All mysteries. And uh, the, the early ones are honestly kind of awesome. She's got a gun, she drinks, she hangs out with bootleggers. <laughs> you know, they were like written in the 20s. <laughs> They're like, great. Um, and the, the later ones are still cool, um, but I took them home. My dad thought they would be perfectly appropriate for an eight or nine year old kid, you know. Uh, my mother threw them away and made me pay the library back out of my allowance because I should have known better than to invite the presence of Satan into her home. <laughs> I'm not even joking. Like this, this literally I, I, happened. My, they'll both back, my, my mother, she has no shame about this. She's like, oh yeah, no, those are terrible. We can't have those in the house. Don't be ridiculous. Um, but but totally fine for small children her opinion was christian fiction which so back in the early 80s so i was born in 75 so i'm talking about the early 80s here in the mid 80s uh there was a trend in christian fiction and that trend was you know blonde haired blue eyed white pioneer lady is saved from being raped by the godless heathens <laughs> right because right of, because of her faith in jesus now, my mother thought that was perfectly serviceable reading material for an eight-year-old. Uh, so I read a bunch of that <laughs> because it's almost around. But I did finally discover by the time I was about 10 or 11 that she had a loophole. And that loophole uh, for, for what amounts to literature, because I think my dad finally cornered her, like, what does literature even mean? Because uh, he had given me some, like, kids lit stuff. I remember he gave me um, a nice edition of Heidi, for example. Uh -huh. it looks, like, looks like that, you know, like... Her mother probably won't throw these away. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> Let's test this <laughs> theory. Not, you know? um, so, so that was okay, because those, those counted as literature. But uh, so he finally cornered her, I think is what happened. And so she decided, well, it counts as literature if the author is dead. Ah. Now that opened up a whole new world, okay? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Lots Hi. of possibilities, yeah. Woo boy, howdy. Uh, so I discovered um, Edgar Allan Poe, because by then they already figured out I like spooky stuff and mysteries. And I think my mom thought maybe I wouldn't really plug into it because it's really old fashioned reading, you know, for, for a kid. Right, in, right. In the 1980s, not the 1880s even. And uh, although he was obviously writing before that. But uh, <laughs> so I, he, dad gave me the compendium. So it's like this, like you could sink a canoe with, with that right. all of the Poe. <laughs> <laughs> so he gave me that one year and I read it forward and backwards. Loved it. Um, and then I think the next year he gave me Sherlock Holmes, the Sherlock Holmes compendium. That's a brick that could yeah. break a window at least. And, and I've read them. I read that one three or four times, the whole thing through. So I, I still know the Holmes canon pretty well. It even had the later stories with Holmes as narrator. I mean, it was a really comprehensive thing, but I get confused. I, I have a hard time sorting out like which story is which, because I read them all in one book. But uh, so that was great. Loved that. And then at some point he gave me H.P. Lovecraft. 
And my mother had never heard of Lovecraft. So she's asking <laughs> him, like, well, now who is this? And I'm like, maybe 13. Like, I'm not very old. <laughs> and my dad's going, oh, well, uh, this guy was writing in the 1920s, like uh, Hemingway. Yeah, and he's dead. Yeah. <laughs> F. Scott Fitzgerald, like those guys. So my mom is just, she's my mom, and she's like, oh, well, that sounds all right. They weren't writing bad things in the 1920s. This will be fine. <laughs> so I read the Lovecraft Compendium and thought it was amazing because I was really, a lot of it went over my head. I was a kid in my defense and a, and a kid raised in a fundy subculture full of white people. Um, <laughs> So, so there was a lot that I missed at that time. But uh, my dad likes to take credit for my career, by the way. I just want to shout out. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Thanks. Thanks, Sherry's dad. If he ever. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. But no, he, he always likes to tell people, oh, yeah, no, that was that was all me. She wasn't allowed to read anything. I snuck her the fun thing. Right. And you I were... showed her Star Wars and I because my dad's a nerd. He, he's a nerdy guy. And that, sorry, excuse me. Sorry, sliding down here. Um, I. <laughs> Listen, I have done so many Dragon Con panels with alcohol. It just felt rude. <laughs> if I didn't do it didn't one. feel right. <laughs> right. I, I had to have something. But no, um, <laughs> so my dad's birthday is um, September 8th, which is right after Dragon Con. And so when I was still in the Southeast every year, I would just, you know, roam the dealer's hall for a day or two and just collect a bunch of swag for dad. I would ask my stepmom, like, what, what shows is, is he into right now? You know? <laughs> Right, right. Find him all that stuff, you know. So, a plus daughter activity over here. But, but no, he he likes to. He he absolutely bears some credit and responsibility for the things that I write now. But but he figured out I really loved ghost stories and things, and so he got me a book of I think Victorian ghost stories, and and he he did tell me to hide it because the fact that it had ghosts in it, uh, nothing supernatural. I wasn't allowed to watch Scooby Doo. I could not even prove to her that the ghosts are always people because she wouldn't watch it. She didn't right, attempt, right. No tempting evil. You know, it's like it's scoopy too. <laughs> but no, she freaked out. She anything with ghosts, uh, anything with science fiction, uh, any of that. So I hid the Victorian ghost book. But that's how I discovered Algernon Blackwood and F. Marion Crawford and Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu and all of these Victorian guys writing these fun ghost stories. Mm. Uh, so so that, that is how I got into that. But uh, my mother had this theory about science fiction in particular that um i don't know how much background to give you here for to make this make sense <laughs> so so i was raised in kind of a fringy arm of seven day adventism in some regards so it's very eschatological jesus is coming back any minute like now wait that could be him at the door it could be now you don't uh, even know you know so there's there's this like sort of damocles over your head anyway when you're a kid and uh but but anyway so she has this theory because of something that's a side note in Revelation somewhere about a false second coming of the Antichrist arriving on Earth. My mother's very into prophecy. Ah, oh. um, yeah, it's fun. <laughs> but there, but there's a thing about the, the false second coming where the Antichrist will come down uh, and pretend that he's Jesus and be like, "What's up, my peeps? So let's come with me." And all the like the people who kind of believe, but they're not true believers because they don't know about the Antichrist. They're going to get caught up with him and they're all going to go to hell. But the Adventists don't really believe in hell. So that was a little tricky for me. I'm unclear. Anyway, <laughs> um, so my mother has this theory that science fiction, I'm not making this up, is a satanic plot designed to acclimate people to the idea of benevolent beings from beyond. So uh -huh. that she thinks the Antichrist is going to come to Earth in a UFO. Okay. I'm not kidding. Swear to God, this is true. She thinks the Antichrist is going to show, Satan's showing up in a UFO. And she thinks that science fiction is broadly speaking a, a satanic plot to get us accustomed to these ideas. And I've tried to talk to her, I don't know how many times, like I, because she doesn't consume any science fiction, I'm like, do you understand how many of these stories end with like the earth completely destroyed? <laughs> like, right, right. Most, most of these are not happy stories about alien interaction. Um, they're, they're, they, they end poorly for humanity more often than not, um, but she won't hear it. No, 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 no. They're just, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's what it's for. Uh, so, so I came to a lot of things late to answer your question of in a little more short form. Uh, I, work from, I work 
work from home by myself. <laughs> it's right, been, right. Class is being indoors. I'm so excited to see you and talk to you. Oh my God. <laughs> that you're not going to shut me up, basically. But, That's um, fine. <laughs> no stop me when you need to but but no there are huge gaps in my reading that sometimes startle even me but if you haven't read this you haven't seen this you haven't done that no I wasn't allowed to do any of that and and I stayed in private Christian school after college and I had my reasons for the college they seem insufficient at this time uh but I, I, I don't have too many regrets I, ha I honestly had some really good teachers at that school and I made some great friends and so forth and so on. But because I was still there, at one point, I nearly got kicked out for having a D&D &D manual. Of college. Oh. Of college. In college? Yeah, it's pretty college. Um, so, so some friends of friends who were off campus thought I would be a fun DM. And they wanted me to learn how to play D&D &D so that I could DM for them. So they gave me some of the books and shit. And somebody ratted me out to a dean. I literally threw them out a window before someone came to check my room. Oh my gosh. I'd already paid it like, it, uh, so I say all that to say this. I didn't uh, really come into genre fiction proper, at least modern genre fiction until the really late nineties. Uh, I graduated college in 98 and went to a public grad school. I went to the University of Tennessee. And nobody gave a shit there, obviously. <laughs> right, right, yeah. <laughs> you know, and the woman I worked for, who's a lovely lady, Dr. Maher, if you're watching, big up. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Maher, I think I have and ended up at the, as the head of rhetoric of the University of Tennessee, liked to read poems and tarot cards in her downtime. I uh, cannot recommend her enough. <laughs> She's a wonderful influence on me. I was Wow. Teacher. That's quite a combination of uh, talents and or activities. You know. I know she's a, and she's she is still with us. That woman, I believe, is in her eighties now. Uh, she was at retirement age then and it just kept on going. Uh, but no, we're still like Facebook friends and everything. I love That's her. fabulous. She's amazing. But so suddenly, I'm surrounded by people who were not from this context and who had recommendations for me. <laughs> so, right. So I came late to an awful lot of the things that people talk about from like the 80s, even though I was born in the 70s myself. And uh, but I missed a lot of it. I saw I saw Star Wars on TV, you know, edited. Uh, over <laughs> on my and like at my dad's, so we could we cut it for time. And, you know, so I didn't know how Star Wars played out in its entirety until I was, you know, 30. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. All straight, you know, uh, but, but that kind of thing. So. Uh, I've completely blanked on your initial question. No, it was about uh, what kind of fantasy and stuff I'd read when I was young. But yeah, or no, if I, you did, yeah, and or if I did. yeah, but and you you did. I, I, I'm sorry, it's so hard to talk on these things. Um, <laughs> no, I I discovered some of the young adult stuff um, when I was in college, and it was kind of broadly allowed, like uh, Tamara Pierce and um, uh, Robin McKinley and Barbara Hambly. Oh, okay, gotcha. Um, yeah. So I, I found them. Um, and I also found, uh, oh God, back when there was still Walden Books and B. Dalton in the mall, baby. Oh um, yeah. In high school, I was a broke kid. I shoplifted a lot. I actually got arrested for it at one point, but that's how, I, <laughs> that's how I got to go live with my dad. I'd gotten in enough trouble that my mother was happy to get rid of me. I was shoplifting makeup at a drugstore when I got caught. It's not like I was robbing banks, you know, <laughs> but, right. um, but I, I did steal books and I shouldn't have, and I feel bad about that, honestly, especially now. Um, but, right, uh, right. <laughs> Yeah, you're done. looking at it from the other side of the counter, so to speak, now. Yeah. Through that obnoxious teenager stealing books. <laughs> but a buddy of mine at the time, a guy uh, who I haven't actually seen in person in years, but we found each other on Facebook a handful of years back, named Nelson Feliciano. Hi, Nelson. Uh, gave me this beat up little ass copy of Interview with a Vampire. Which came ah. Out, yeah, it, it came out in 77, I believe, 77 or 78. And I read it in, it was probably around 1990. And it just changed my life. I was, I was from the Southeast. I spent a lot of time in New Orleans anyway. Um, oh, that was, that, was, that was my awakening with that little stolen copy. Because he stole it. He stole it from oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this little stolen mass market paperback. Of gotcha. The old kind of gold green cover. Remember mm -hmm. like the giant block letters, those guys? And I stole the rest of them. And I used to sneak 
Star Trek and Beauty and the Beast, the TV series, and, and there were tie-in novels that went along with those, and Barbara Hamley wrote a lot of both, actually, and um, I would steal anything. For, I owe that woman probably a thousand dollars, quite frankly. Huh? <laughs> Okay. but like I, I didn't I, I had a little money but not real like my allowance was like 15 bucks a month you know my dad was in the army we didn't have any money my mom was a single parent elementary school teacher like we were broke ass but um so I stole a lot of books because my mother wouldn't let me buy them outright anyway and I hid them and I stashed them and and, uh, and years later on live journal Barbara Hambly added me and I thought I was just gonna die just like oh there oh yeah oh my god Barbara Hamley knows I exist this is the greatest uh, day of my life and then I met Tamar Pierce at um uh, uh, uh we were in Detroit we were at an event there it might have been Confusion or Penguin Con or one of those but she is also delightful I'm just like oh my god I haven't met Robin McKinley because I read The Hero on the Crown and of uh, Blue no Blue um I'm confusing Blue Sword and Blue Rose look it was the 80s <laughs> I yeah, I think it. it's the blue sword is blue what sword, hers. the blue sword was hers and the hero in the crown. Hmm. And uh, she, she's the only one I'm missing from from my my, my deck of cool ass ladies from back in the day, because I have met now like Delia Sherman and, uh, and, and I haven't met Terry Winley, uh, but we're like Internet friendly. <laughs> oh, there you all, go. All of these wonderful people who I would have died to have spoken to when I was a teenager because I was barely aware of them. And I stole from them like the horrible person I am. But in, <laughs> in my defense, I stole from everybody and I was 15. <laughs> you were an equal opportunity or, you know, you, you just managed to get around to all of them. Okay. I stole at least as much from L'Oreal or Urban Decay as I stole from the nice ladies of fantasy. I still feel bad about it though. And I remember thinking <laughs> that one of the things that kind of drove it for me, uh, I want to say we were at like a Costco or something or the or your Sam's Club or something. But they had, you know, their discount books then, and obviously, I had to rummage. Maybe the grocery store. I don't remember, but um, I found Black Trillium, which was mm. the, the hardback that they were clearing out for like four bucks after it moved to trade. And uh, it was Andre Norton and um, um, uh, Judith Tarr and oh, who was the other one? There's three women writing these three novellas that tied into this whole story. I loved them. Like, oh my God, there are women writing this stuff. This is so cool. And just, I, I, I came to everything in bits and pieces, but I got here eventually. And that's the important part, I hope. <laughs> yeah, well, no, that's great because that kind of ties into what my my second question right, was question. for you, <laughs> which is, uh, when did you decide, you know, to try your hand at writing yourself? And so you you've put, you've started to answer that you were kind of inspired by Black Brilliant, okay? <laughs> Part of it, I was that was one of the ones that I could actually afford, and I, you know what I did actually? I, I took the um because it had a dust jacket, I took the dust jacket off, and I told my mother that it was about like uh, biology, like it was about flowers <laughs> or something. It does sound kind of sciencey, yeah. It, it uh, sciencey. I was like, oh, it's these three ladies writing about these rare flowers. Mm. And so she let me buy that one, uh, but but I, I couldn't pull that trick every time, you know. Right, so I decided, right. I, I decided I wanted to be a writer when I was very very small. Um, my I always told stories, and it was always my thing. And my mother has a story to tell a nice story about. Me. <laughs> my mother has a story she likes to tell about me when I was about not quite three. Um, I was very verbal very early and I read by the time I was about three, but a little before that, because my sister wasn't born yet and she was born right before I turned three. Uh, my mother used to sew and it's the seventies. This would have been around 77, 78. And she had a big gray sewing machine case. She used to strike matches on, I remember that, like as a random detail, but uh, she had this big sewing machine on the dining room table and she was sewing something. And I was telling her a story. And, uh, and she's like, no, it's funny. You were like climbing up and down chairs. And at one point you, you climbed up onto the dining room table and you raised your hand and again, evangelical household. Right, I right. Was, <laughs> I was telling a story about my cousins, Arthur, Jackie and Ryan and me and because they were basically the only three other kids I knew. <laughs> right, right, there you go. Right, they're my cousins, you know. And at the end of the story, I stood up on top of the table behind the sewing machine and I raised my hand and said, and then Jackie said, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. <laughs> and, 
And my mom's like, well, then you had my attention. And I was like, and then? But apparently what I said was, that's the end. And I hopped <laughs> <laughs> leave them wanting more that's what i say uh, that's right <laughs> I, I don't remember this but i can picture this but but i finally started trying to write my own stuff actually after i ended up moving in with my dad and stepmom when i was um not quite 15 it was it was the summer i turned 15 so my, uh, my dad and stepmom were in the army <clears throat> i had been arrested i was a problem child uh which my dad didn't really agree with and he and his my stepmom I uh, had a new baby and they were both working full time. They, they were military medical people. My dad was CRNA and uh, my stepmom was an ER nurse. And they were doing these 24 hour shifts. My stepmom was on the reserve. She was gone a week every month, you know, and they had a new baby. Useful person right here. Let me come live with right, you. Right, right. The baby and they're like, <clears throat> cool. So the baby monitor went in my room and I took care of him. But in the time that I lived there with him when he was very small. And by the way, he is expecting a child with his wife now. So I feel very old. <laughs> <laughs> that dude is 30. <laughs> so, and a wonderful person who I cannot recommend heartily enough. And I'm very excited to have a new niece or nephew. Lit. It's going to be fun. Yay. Uh, but, but while I was there, I finally had the freedom to like trial this crazy shit. And my dad didn't really feel like there was any point in censoring kind of what I was consuming at a certain level. Like I had a, a friend named Tamara who was also out of a really strict fundy background, which is why her parents let her hang out with me because they knew about mine. They did not understand that my dad and stepmom were not part of that background. Um, but that's how oh. she, told her parents so she could come hang out with me. Um, and this was far enough, ago, oh God, this was maybe 89, 90, you know, so they were in the middle of nowhere in Kentucky because they were stationed at Fort Knox. And there was a gas station at an intersection between these two two lane roads. It was brand new, lit up like a, you know, for Christmas, Six Flags over diesel, basically. <laughs> it's where you can see it for miles around, right? It's the only thing for miles around. <laughs> right. but they, had, they had video rental, 99 cent video rentals, um, $1.99 if it was a new release. And so my dad, if I had friends come over for the night, I was totally allowed. Uh, he, he and my stepmom often either worked overnight or my stepmother was gone. Because again, they were hospital people. And uh, I, he didn't care if I had friends over, he trusted me and he would let us watch whatever we wanted to watch because my little brother was too small to pay attention to any of it. And Tamara, one day, cause she was with me and we're in the gas station. She's like, oh, we have to rent this. And I, I was like, I've never heard of this. What is it? She's like, it's the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Oh, geez. <laughs> I have no idea how she ever saw it in the first place. But she somehow like snuck it. Like I used to, she probably stole it. <laughs> I mean, she didn't uh, I did. I was like, she stole a copy somewhere. I don't know. Um, but my dad's like, yeah, Tim Curry's pretty fun. You were bound to see this even. He knew, I was already a Tim Curry fan. I loved Clue. He was like my favorite actor. And he's like, ah, you were going to see this eventually. <laughs> Sure, here you go. I no, may as well. I'm 15. <laughs> you know, what do I know? Uh, but he was gone. And so me and Tamara set up and watched the Rock Door Picture Show while my little brother slept across our lap. And uh, it, it just one of those other things that just kind of changed my life. And I caught up on uh, Star Wars and Star Trek and all the, you know, but I was in the middle of nowhere. And the nearest city was Fort Knox, which is, you, know, you can walk across it in an hour. It's, it's well, at least you could then. I don't know. I haven't been there in a long time now. But <laughs> uh, back in the day, you could walk across it in you know, 20 minutes or whatever. It was not very big. It was not very interesting. The library was terrible. It was a little tiny thing with virtually no CDs or, or, or it was tapes. <laughs> tapes at the time. Tapes and just beginning to have CDs. Right, right. But we could go to the PX and sometimes they had music there and books there. Hmm, sometimes. Uh, but so, so I, I was able to fill in some of that education, but it was not very comprehensive. But that's where I started writing, excuse me, my very first book. And the first one I ever finished uh, was, was that first year I moved in with him when I was 16. It was, I wrote it over the summer. It was called um, Who Buried the Grave Digger? It's about a ghost. <laughs> it's about a Victorian ghost on a southern plantation. Again, white girl. Uh, not a lot of context. Uh, <laughs> who has to solve his own murder? 
and um, I was very proud of this. And I printed it out on a dot matrix printer. Ah. And I mailed it to, there was a contest or something going on. I don't remember the details, but I sent it to, and I remember this very distinctly, Ellen Datlow, Teresa Nielsen Hayden, and an editor who I believe is no longer with us. But those two women in particular, I have since gotten to meet. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Like, yeah. Oh my God, this is amazing. You know? uh, but but I, I was 15, 16, so we're talking like 1990 maybe. Uh, when I first started making these efforts toward, I, I, I can sell books, I can, I can write stuff and people will pay me for it, maybe. Um, and in college, I guess it was by then my probably fifth or sixth, everybody's got Trump novels. I have about eight or nine, I think. Oh, my fifth, okay. My fifth or sixth one, uh, God, which one was it? I don't remember. Anyway. I had one that got some nibbles from agents for a few minutes mm. of my, my sophomore year of college, but didn't go anywhere. And the first one I finally sold, I uh, sold while I was in, um, I was in graduate school. So it would have been around 2001, give or take. Well, anyway, early 2000s. And uh, that one became 4 and 20 Blackbirds, my, my very first book that was ever published. But the, yeah, that one, only it wasn't that yeah. edition. It wasn't that yeah. so that was first published by a little tiny micro press in Marietta, Georgia, called Marietta Publishing, and um, it was bad. It was not just a bad experience; it was a bad production. It was full of typos, riddled with errors. Uh, the guy that the publisher paid to copy edit, um, and I have since become friends. Coincidentally, actually, we met at another event. We met at an event in Dahlonega. Actually, oh how and funny! He no, he's delightful, lovely man. He submitted all his changes and the publisher ignored them and just sent it to press. And um, it was it was that I got paid three hundred dollars for an advance, three hundred bucks. Oh, yeah. Last I heard, although it's been a hot minute, Bruce is the name of the man who now does seminars on how to get published. Um, was telling people I owed him money, even though at one point he continued to produce and sell these books even after it had sold to Tor. And uh, Tor came down on him like the fist of God, as I understand it. Like, no, this is a new edition. You don't get to sell that anymore. You rescinded the copyright. And I had it in writing. We called him Mad Bruce the Pirate. It's a long story. <laughs> uh, so Mad Bruce the Pirate and I finally parted ways. But, but that was like another crazy story. And, and don't worry, it's short. In a nutshell, I was still <laughs> querying by mail, you know? Cause, right, you know, oh yeah, the yeah. Night, early 2000s. And, um, like you still had, you had to print it by a box, a special box to mail your manuscript in and send it off with a safety. Self-addressed stamp and do it. So I had a policy where I would send out five at a time. That's all I could afford. I was a grad student working three jobs. You know, I could afford to do five of these at a time to pay for the paper, to pay for the ink, to pay for the postage and the boxes. So that's what I did, five at a time. And one of the places I queried sent me a polite, I got a lot of polite, slips you know thank you but no thank you right or, you know no big what so one day about two years after i stopped sending or no this was like a year after it was first published by marietta i get this email and the subject line is something to the effect of oh my god i hope you're still checking this email because <laughs> that's like, not weird at all <laughs> that's not weird um <laughs> but the return address was an at tour.com and i'm like Tor, did I query tour? I don't think I did. Um, and, and I hadn't for some reason, I don't remember why, but I hadn't. I'd actually queried, um, I think NAL, NAL or whatever it was called. Uh -huh. uh, their offices were like in the same building or something. I don't know exactly what the deal was. And I don't remember who I queried. This was a long ass time ago. Um, but this email was from this, this like 20 year old editorial assistant named Liz Gorinsky, who now runs Erewhon Press, by the way. Yeah. She's an awesome, awesome editor in person. Cannot recommend her enough. But we were both very young. We're both in our early 20s. And she had, um, and I think I'm a couple years older than her actually, but she had been given the job of cleaning out an office from an editor who died. And oh. she, she found the proposal packet for 4 and 20 Blackbirds in a box under this desk. And she can't throw away anything without reading it first. 
but I had moved. And this was back when you didn't keep your phone number, you know? Right, this right. Also, this was also back at the time when there was a big kind of, fluffle isn't the quite, quite the right word, but it's close enough uh, in genre fiction. Cause I read a lot of writer's digest. <laughs> I read a lot of that stuff. I was like, I'm gonna figure out how to crack in in this market, man. Um, about whether or not it was professional to include an email address. Cause a lot of oh my like, gosh, they're like, that's just not professional. People aren't going to communicate that way. That's don't, don't do that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but I did anyway. And it was a Yahoo address, which I no longer have. Um, it was CM priestess at Yahoo. Man, no, I, I haven't had it for probably a decade or more. And, uh, so that's why she, cause she tried calling the number. She had sent me a, a letter and it had bounced back to New York. This was that long ago. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Yeah. Know, right? But she caught me by email while I was at work one day. I was like, holy, oh my God. And this is, yeah, it's great. Led to a three book deal with tour and it was functionally the start of my career, but it was probably maybe my eighth book that I'd finished when all was said and done, but they're all trunks and I never did anything. And they're, and I want to be clear, they're not worth saving. I've cannibalized a few of them for characters. Ah, yeah. They're not worth and, and that's okay. And that's why I always tell people like, keep it, keep it. You can use it. Yeah. Because you might, you might end up using a little bit as you're saying, just to, you know, for yeah. something else. You but now I mean? that's, a, that's an awesome story about, about this series, which was a trilogy. And can you, can you give us just in case there's anybody watching this, who has never read this book? Can you give us kind of your elevator pitch summary of what this what this book and what this trilogy is about? Uh, I see dead people uh, in Chattanooga, Tennessee. It's a girl, uh, a young woman. When I wrote her, she was a couple years older than me, <laughs> like twenty four. Right, um, right. But it's a young woman who sees ghosts. And uh, she, her mother died basically when she, she was very, very small as functionally as an infant. She was raised by her aunt and uncle. And uh, in, in this, it, it's a weird little urban fantasy, Southern Gothic. I was trying to do an urban fantasy um, set someplace that wasn't California or New York. I, I wanted to do something Gothic with it. Like, mm -hmm. and Southern Gothic, like New England Gothic can be so cool. Like I did Maple Croft as a New England Gothic. That was fun, but, I, but I'm a Southerner. And right. So, I spent a lot of time on the Gulf Coast. I was born in Florida, ended up in Southeast Texas, and then ended up in Tennessee for a long time. And I, 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 I wanted to tell the story about this cool little city I lived in and this chick in it. And now there are a lot of things I would do differently, quite honestly. I, I, I feel like, so Eden, who's the main character, she's biracial, for example. And, and I made her biracial because she's based loosely on, on three different women who I knew at the time who all coincidentally were biracial. And now I feel like, that, that was probably not the right call. That's, that's, I, I needed to stay in my lane. Like I, I was, my intentions were good, <laughs> but I think that somebody else could have maybe told that story a little better or told it differently, or maybe I should have just, you know, stayed a little closer to my own experience. Uh, but, but I tried really hard and, and I, I'm pretty happy with how it came out, but, but there are a lot of little things I would change about that trilogy going back if, if I could. Well, I'm sure that's true, though, for a lot of people when they look oh, back sure on is. something they've written, you know, that long ago. Yeah, uh, it, it, we, we live, we learn, we try to do better next time. And that's, that's really all I can say. Like, like I, there are things about that that I, I, I wish I hadn't done and would not do again. But uh, I will try to do better going forward. And uh, you know, that's literally all I can do. So that's what I try to do. But uh, the series broke me out. But then by the third book, I, I had moved to Seattle. My, my husband took a job out here. And um, I, I wasn't so close to home and so close to, frankly, the market for it. And it got that third book. I could have sold more copies out of a trench coat in the park. <laughs> you know, it was out of the trunk of my car, maybe. And I kind of thought that my career might be dead <laughs> by that third book. But I, but I got lucky. And we had done a couple other little side projects. I did a couple of the subterranean that were very fun. I did. Um, I have uh, one of them right here, which I also. Yeah, I did Dreadful Skin. Yeah. And, um, uh, those who went, but I think that was actually later. But uh, and, and then Fathom, which was my first hardback that came out, and I really liked that one. That was 1930s in rural Florida. That was fun. Uh, nobody yeah. bought that one either. My nip slip uh, cover. <laughs> it was like I, a statue with a little. <clears throat> 
Uh, yeah. I bought it. And uh, <laughs> the, the thing about this one is it's the first one of your books that I read. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I, 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 I like that one. <laughs> yeah, I read this one first and then ended up with the Eden Moore yeah, with series. The Eden but, but this one I read first. And you know how I think it happened? We'll give a little shout out to Paul Godallen, who oh. who wrote uh, or who used to run the the yeah uh, he ran I still the uh, book. <laughs> oh good good yeah oh yeah um, and I I you know I he used to run a an online uh, book club mm. uh, the paranormal fiction for uh, Barnes and Noble when he wrote a lot of reviews and stuff for them. And so he had chosen this one as a selection not too long after I first got involved with that group. And that's how, so that was my introduction to you. So one of the only uh, people who did. <laughs> yeah. I really liked that one. Like I like uh, Gaspar was at least hypothetically a real historic figure. I think he probably wasn't, but Florida likes to say that he is. Right, right. Fits and right in. Fits right in. They have Gasparilla every year. And I, I feel like it's the kind of thing where like a bunch of white people who didn't actually know anything about like Spanish, like Gasparilla or Gasparilla, it means like the little Gaspar, like junior over here. I feel right, like, a, right. like a big, awesome pirate maybe would not call himself that. Like <laughs> maybe that He's would been be- He's integrating himself, yeah. Also, he was supposed to be like really super brutal. And there's like this, this urban legend or rural legend, if you will about him like capturing a, some princess or something and killing her on some island. And that's why it's called like Sanibel Island. That was her name. I'm pretty sure Sanibel is actually the name of like a line of feminine hygiene products in Mexico. Oh, geez. <laughs> right, like no, it's that, it, it, but there's like a lot of, I feel like it's a bunch of people who didn't speak Spanish thinking that- They didn't Spanish know, yeah. And maybe they would just build on it from there. So now it's basically Florida man, the convention on the water every year in Tampa Bay and it's great fun I have Gasparilla coins from when I was a kid but uh it's a uh, yeah anyway that was a fun book to do and I wanted again to like take a place that I loved and that I was familiar with and then I could tell a story about and that's just how the book about but then uh then Bone Shaker happened and yeah and sh- and shit got weird <laughs> yeah it did I was actually telling somebody a story about when after this came out um <laughs> we were talking, it was another uh, track director um, who was telling me a story about uh, about someone who had taken issue with a book. Oh, the, yeah. the, it was there just one of those. Uh, but, but the one that I was that I was relating was you had gotten some kind of comment or I think I think this guy actually wrote you an email, you know, the personally. Email. Oh, yeah, okay. that that he told you that your science on zombies just that oh, no, just that was Charlie yeah. Strauss. Those are two different things. So oh, this, okay. I got this one email from this gentleman. Uh, so, so the elevator pitch for Bone Shaker is yes, yes, we'll do that. Yeah. It's all right. It's 1879. Uh, there was an industrial accident in the pioneer city of Seattle that uh, re- a drill machine released poisonous gas, turns people into zombies. They wall off the city. But some people still live down there through a lot of very contrived means. Anyway, um, there is a sequence where the protagonist, uh, Briar Wilkes, uh, is running through the Pike Place Market, which is quite old for the West Coast. I think it was established in 1907. Sounds that right? So I get emails. <laughs> like this one guy was like, Dear Ms. Priest. He's very formal the whole time. Like, I picked up your book, Bone Shaker. And I was very intrigued. I really liked it. Uh, I used to do dramatic readings of this email. I would leave off his name. I'm not, I'm not an asshole. I left off his name, but it was an amazing email. Um, I lost it when I lost the Yahoo account, actually. Oh, no. Um, okay. It was, it was to my Yahoo account back in the day. Um, but he's like, and I was really intrigued and very interested. And I thought you were a very compelling writer until I got to the part about the Pike Place Market. And the Pike Place Market was not established until 1907. And that just took me right out of this story. And I just <laughs> could not follow it anymore. And it was signed, this guy's name, which I have, I'm not being coy, I've completely forgotten it. <laughs> it was, you know, Bob Smith, whatever. Who right. Could, 
been a great fan of your work, but now never shall be. <laughs> and I'm just like, wow, you, you read right past the zombies. Right, right. <laughs> right past the walking dead in Seattle in 1879. And, and the thing is, I had an afterword. Actually, it was Liz's idea because she was also the editor on that. Liz was my editor for a really long time until she left to form Marijuana. She was my editor at Tor. And uh, so she, she was also the editor on Bone Sugar. And uh, she's like, maybe we should have a little, a little extra chapter like about the real history that you use. Right, I remember that, yeah. Right, maybe it'll head off the I mean, <laughs> It did not head off the <laughs> So, so there's an afterword. There's like, so my husband said, and he, he still says, I should have had a, a page on my website dedicated to yes, I know. Yes, right, I yes, know. yes. The Civil War ended when it did and did not run up to 1881. Yeah, it's like you're kind of missing the point. Yeah. I, I know. I, I know that the Pike Place Market uh, was not established until 1907, and I have it appearing in 1879. I know, I know, I know, I know. Um, kind of the, sh the shtick for it was, like, uh, it, nothing drives technology quite like war. And I thought, well, if the American Civil War had dragged on for a generation uh, for X, Y, Z, P, D, and Q reasons, I never wanted the South to win the war. The South lost the war when they declared the war, and I will die on that hill. Uh, when you pick a fight with a more populous, more technologically advanced neighbor that's immediately next door, what the hell do you think is going to happen? Right, right. It's not going to end well. How committed are you to owning people, really? Uh, so that's that's not okay. But that's what I used to drive the technology. So I thought, well, if I just keep the war running, because I mean, medical communication, uh, not not just weaponry, like everything uh, gets gets a drive through war. War and well, and now in the in the twentieth and twenty first century, space exploration as well has joined that that queue of things that drive technology. Uh, so we got Tang, <laughs> Tang and Velcro <laughs> we got from the space program, but also a bunch of other useful and important things. But anyway, I have this at the back of the book, and, but I still got these emails just left, right, and center, and it just drove me insane. But the thing that you were first talking about was Charlie Strauss. So Charlie is a British uh, science fiction author. And first, let me disclaim, lovely human being. We have since become internet friends. But he did this big blog post, and it was very rattling his cane, you kids with your steampunk, stay off my lawn. Oh, no, okay. Oh, yes. And so this blog post, like in the, I want to say like the first paragraph, he's like, you know, there's no science in this science fiction. It's all bad science. And then he said, I'm looking at you, Sherry Priest, with your steam powered zombies. And he linked to my website <laughs> and he crashed it. <laughs> oh my gosh. That, I do remember amazing, that now. Yeah. I got this amazing spike in sales. It was fantastic. I'm like, I'm going to buy that man a drink. Anywhere I go, I don't even care. He drinks for free in my presence forever. And That's ever. right, right. It's like you can call ahead wherever you know he's going to be. Yeah, buy and that a drink. And, and again, we have since become friendly. He's he's lovely. He was just being mostly, I think, just being funny. Um, but it was it's fine. And it was like that man was so mean to you. I'm like, are you serious? Yeah. Well, and I mean, when it comes down to it, if he, uh, you know, he, 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 he was drawing attention to it. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think that, you know, you've said many times that, you know, it was bone shaker that made my career. You, I, was, I was an overnight success after 10 years and seven books. Go. There you go. And, and it's, it's a great series. And the, the cool thing about the series is that each one of the books is slightly different. Yeah, they, and, I try to make them all stand alone, but still. Fit yeah, that, that was kind of my goal. I was I was trying to pattern it kind of after um, Pratchett and Discworld, uh, which I didn't discover until I was well into my 20s. I worked at this big used bookstore called McKay in Chattanooga. It's one of the biggest ones in the East, in the East period. Mm -hmm. We had a monthly circulation of like 30,000 books. And um, I was uh, one of their nonfiction directors. I, I did literature and Christianity because because I knew a lot about Christianity. Right, right. Yeah, you were the perfect person for that. So they gave me Christianity and literature, and I had another section or two, but those were the two main ones. And um, but but I discovered Pratchett through that. But the first Terry Pratchett book I ever read was um, Feet of Clay, and it, you know, in the middle of the series, you know, whatever. But 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 I got it. Like okay, I've picked up what's happening. I've picked up this location. 
I picked up these. All right. Okay. Got it. Let's go. And then I read the rest of them entirely out of order, but it was okay. And if I was going to do multiple books in this series, <clears throat> sorry, no reflux from the room. <laughs> uh, I, I wanted it to be okay for people to pick up any individual book and right. kind of plug into what's happening. And um, so, so that's that's why I did that. I did that for that. And I've got to say, I've I enjoyed them all, but I think I have a, a special fondness for Dreadnought. Oh, that was one of my favorites too. I dedicated it to my dad and stepmom because they were the, the military nurses who I grew up with. Ah, uh, and, um, and uh, yeah, it's in the dedication there for the pair of them. I just, yeah, I just really, really, I mean, I love them all, but that one was the one well, that, you know. I, I like that one too. Well, the number one piece of uh, complaint that Sky's just feedback <laughs> about Bone Shaker was, um, well, but what's the rest of the country look like? Be because conveniently, when it comes to the American Civil War, not a lot of West Coast action. I kind of say whatever I want. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, there's still a war going on back east. Who cares? Uh, right. But going like, well, but so the idea was, so the Civil War is still going on because um, Texas is, is its own independent nation. I had them discover oil at Spindletop uh, a few decades early. So Texas kind of becomes Texas Instruments. It becomes this big technological powerhouse that is its own independent thing that allies with the confederacy and also the uk stays involved in the war and gives the south their navy so i was like okay so if say they have this powerful tech ally and they have a navy and maybe because a lot of their actual decent strategists in the south uh died early on or in the middle of the war i'm like well what if they kept maybe stonewall what if they kept you know some of these other guys like maybe they could have hung on for a few more years didn't have to deal with that in Bone Shaker because it all happens out in the Pacific Northwest. There you <laughs> but, go. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but, but people were like, well, what does that look like in the rest of the country? So, so that's where Dreadnought came from. So it starts in Virginia and this woman takes a train trip to Seattle that she doesn't know anything about after her husband dies. And um, I got to do, I found um, Louisa May Alcott. I realize that sounds like a jump, but it's not. Louisa May Alcott, when she was a young woman, decided that she wanted to contribute to the war effort. And uh, so she ended up volunteering to be a nurse in a hospital in DC and she wrote about it. And uh, you know, the Dover 99 cent editions, mm -hmm. nothing. but I found one of those and it was so helpful. It was like, well, you know, here are the names of what people call diseases, what people called this type of injury, what people treated them with, what they called it, you know, how they used it. And uh, so I got hold of, of that. And uh, also like my, my so my, my dad does anesthesia or, or did until he retired. And um, so talk to him about some historic stuff, like the Spanish-American War was kind of the beginning of modern anesthesia on the battlefield sort of stuff. And, and uh, got to pull all that together into a story about a nurse. And, and the thing about nurses in the 19th century, there was no program for it. If you just showed up and said you were willing to bathe a filthy, wounded, naked man, they were like, here, you're a nurse, <laughs> let's go. No, but I'm serious, like, a here's, job. Your, here's your job, bitch, go. Uh, but Louisa May Alcott showed up at this hospital as like a rich upper class white girl who's going to go do her part for the war effort. And she gets there and a woman who's been working there a while hands her a bar of soap and says, see that line of dudes over there? Bathe them. <laughs> and she's like, uh, they're naked. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they need to be. Go, go take care of them. <laughs> All right. Let's go. <laughs> Throw her in, see if she can swim. So it, but also a lot of my family from that time, they, they were poor ass, broke, uneducated people. They couldn't read, couldn't write. And you didn't have to be able to read or write in order to be a nurse. You literally just had to show up and be willing to do gross stuff. So a lot of young women went into it to kind of get out of the house, to contribute, to, to be part of something bigger than them. And it was great. But so when I did Mercy, who's the protagonist of, of Dreadnought, I wanted to kind of inform her with all of that. So I have her being like barely functionally literate. She can barely read and write, like not very well at all, but she has a lot of practical experience. Mm -hmm. And I, I felt like the kind of person that you don't see stories told about so much are very, very smart people who like educational opportunities, who went on to be successful and very good at what they do, despite their lack of formal education. And I, I thought that 
I, I liked her. She, she remains one of my favorite protagonists. And, and my parents are both very excited, or my dad's stepmom, <laughs> that, that I had uh, dedicated a book to them about this. Um, so yeah, that's one, that's one of my favorites too. Sorry, I didn't mean to ramble about that. <laughs> oh no, that's cool. I, I didn't like, realize, I, I know we're had never talked to you, but yeah. But that's what that was. I about. had never talked to you about that aspect of it. So I didn't, I did not know that story. So that's very yeah. cool. It was um, um, Now, kind of in the midst of all this, you also did something else. <laughs> that, no, you know, no, you no, know no, me no. and my personal favorites. Yeah. Um, well, I say that, and yet it's hard to pick actual. But I love that series. And oh, thank you. I wish we got to do more. Yeah, the the or the duology, but yeah. however you want to put it. Wildly and, you, misnamed trilogy. <laughs> yeah, and uh, do you um, ha, do you have a little bit of an elevator pitch for that? Uh, obsessive compulsive vampire thief in Seattle. <laughs> yeah. Well, like something that jumped out at me about Vampire Legends because I was reading all the old stuff before I came to the new stuff was like um, one of one of the international threads, like through all the different various traditions is obsessive compulsion right uh, right you, you can't follow me if i do these two lines cross just like this you can't cross running water uh if i throw depending on your culture a handful of rice a handful of sand a handful of grain whatever they have to stop and they have to count it all before they can continue to follow you and i was like man that just sounds like my sister when she's off her meds you know? yeah <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm scared. So my sister and I both have OCD. My sister's a little more severe than mine, and she's been medicated off and on for a very long time. And uh, I was like, this this really just sounds like someone with OCD. Right, but right. Like, like clinical OCD. I don't mean like cutesy. Ha ha ha. I'm very particular about. No, I mean like clinical OCD, which is what we have. And um, I talked to her a little bit about it back in the day when I was first working on it, and. I remember one of the things that stood out to me about that conversation, she was like, sometimes when I'm having a spiral, I will do anything to pull myself out of that spiral. I grasp, I reach, I talk to whoever, I say whatever, I do whatever. And then the next day you feel ridiculous about it and you wish you hadn't done it. But at the time it was the only thing you could do. And I'm like, well, yeah. okay, what if we have a vampire like that? Somebody with clinical OCD. And um, what if this is actually her thing and so I set up so her father was like a Pinkerton agent back in the 20s or you know whatever and uh, now she's a professional thief and she's a very good thief because she's very very meticulous and um they were fun to do I would have loved to have done more the first one did pretty good but the second one and I always kind of felt it this would not be true now but at the time when those books came out I always felt they should have gone to mass market instead of trade they, they were mm -hmm. mass market they were beach reads you know, they were they were fun. Throw it in your bag. Reads. They were not intended to be life changing or profound. I wanted to write something fun and something funny and something that people would just kind of generally enjoy. And well, um, they, I, they really should go that math. I think. Well, that but, makes sense. I get what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I had a pitch for a third on deck called Sawbones, where um 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 Raylene Raylene's the name. Sorry, it's been mm -hmm. a while since I read this. But Raylene um, gets a commission to steal a haunted baseball oh. uh, from a 19th century player who got the nickname Sawbones because he was just like basically a brutal dude with a, he, was, he was an asshole with a baseball bat who liked hurt right. people. But when he died, there was like this curse on all of his stuff. And like basically uh, anybody who owns this baseball signed by him from like 1895 or whatever um, loses all of their luck. So that her OCD, which is normally kind of, so my OCD at least, is often a, um, a buttress. Uh, like, you know, right. I have prepared for all of these things. I have taken all of these measures and I will be okay. But what if you're not and you've done everything you can, you've taken all the measures you can. Like just the loops that would throw this woman for where it doesn't matter how careful she is. No, it doesn't matter you know, what she has done or what she has sacrificed or what she's prepared, it doesn't matter. She's not lucky now <laughs> and everything's just gonna go to hell. But uh, no, the second one didn't sell. And the funny thing is I get fan mail about those books at least once a month, even now, sometimes a couple times a month. Wow, and that's it's great. Like, it's like if all of you people had bought the second book. At the time, yeah. The book. <laughs> well, now I would like, you know, uh, well, I, read the book or both books when I was a reviewer at Bitten by Books 
Yeah. Which is, you know, no longer around, but um, one out. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, what uh, what one of the things that I said about it in my review was so uh, that I said each of her series and works I'm trying to read it in the dark here has a distinct voice and tone demonstrating peace priests prodigious facility with language and narrative technique and bloodshot is no exception. So that but I know I remember specifically when I was reading that book that I was like what this is share you know i mean it was so different that it was just it was incredibly cool so i that, that did um that did impress me and i read a lot you know I so know you I mean, that that did you and Paul probably read more than anybody else i know <laughs> yes well anyway i i hope that Okay, maybe we will get a, a return to chess. Who knows? I, I have um, long joked that I ought to do it at least as a novelette or something and just self-produce it. But uh, but life keeps getting in the way and right. Got other stuff. To I do understand. Stuff. And and well, you you have animals. Uh, what's that? Uh, we got animals. Uh, <laughs> there's a, a new one coming out this fall that is kind of urban fantasy adjacent. I would say because urban fantasy does not sell like it used to, and so people are shifting the genre. Right, trying to do different things. Yeah. Right. Well, now, then we have yeah, Maplecroft, Maplecroft that Lizzie Austin. Borden dispatches. Yes. Why did Cthulhu with an axe? Lizzie Borden, yeah. No, the high yeah, so, that was a, a 19th century epistolary style retelling of Dracula. Um, and the low pitch was it's Lizzie Borden fighting monsters with an axe. Just run with it. Um, no. <laughs> but it was and fun. it's fabulous. And, I mean, well, it's. I got to use well, the real story was so strange, you know. Right, like, exactly. It's the perfect it's setup. So weird, and it's so much weirder than most people know. Like everybody knows the jump rope run, Lizzie Borden took an ass, you know, right? But the right. real case was so weird, and um, so like it's it's told from several different points of view. But one of them is from the doctor who who actually lived across the street from them at the time. I named him a uh, uh, Seabury or uh, Owen Seabury is what I named yeah. him because. Of, the real doctor's last name was Bowden and it was too close to Borden and I didn't want to confuse people. But in real life, it's confusing. But, but right, in fact, right. In real life, the doctor lived across the street from the Borden family and, and I made him uh, one of the point of view characters. And there, his, his introductory chapter where he talks about his experience with the Borden family leading up to the murders and everything, um, almost every single thing in that chapter is true. Almost every, the only thing that, that isn't true that didn't happen is the bit about the necklace. I added the necklace, but the gotcha, rest, yeah. that all really happened. And he testified about it. Like the court transcripts are online. They're not hard to find. And I, yeah, I, and I, I, I think he's the reason actually she was exonerated when all was said and done. I, I think that he didn't want to believe that she had done it. And so he said that she had not, I don't know if she did or not, but uh, people ask me, oh, what do you think? Eh, fuck if I know. Um, uh, really? <laughs> I wasn't there. What do I know? Yeah. Knows, right. But um, he, he testified on her behalf repeatedly and aggressively that he didn't think she could have done it. And I really do think it's because he felt guilty, like he should have done something. He should have intervened before it came to this. So the, it, it, in, in really real life, in a nutshell, don't worry, what had happened was um, uh, the family for about a year leading up to the murders had been complaining that somebody was trying to kill them. They'd been telling literally anybody who would listen to them that somebody was trying to kill them. In fact, they even had samples of their food sent off to the local universities to be tested because they believed someone was trying to poison them. So it was Andrew and his wife, and she was his second wife, and she was much younger than him, and his grown daughters did not like her. So Andrew and his wife live in part of the house, and then uh, Lizzie and her sister lived in the other part of the house, a Emma. Emma was her name. And Emma was older than Lizzie by like eight or 10 years. She was considerably older than her too and was disabled in a way that's unclear now. Might have been tuberculosis, might have been fibro, who knows. Uh, we're not gonna find out now. But so the girls live on this side, the parents live on this side and uh, they all think, they all one of the only things they agree on is that they're being targeted somehow and they can't figure out how. So one night, Again, in real life, this is in the court transcript. One night, uh, Ms. Abigail Borden, Andrew's wife, comes across the street 
and beats on the doctor's door in the middle of the night. And she was like, you have to help us. Someone is trying to kill us. And he's like, lady. Because at this point, it's been like a year of this nonsense from these people across the street. It's like, lady. Right, right. He's about had it, yeah. He's had it. Uh, he's done. He is bored with this by now. He has treated them all for everything he can. And, he, 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 it, and I used some of the medical stuff from the transcript in, in that chapter. He treated them for everything he could. It's like, lady, nobody's trying to kill you. Go home. Go to bed. Call it a night. Literally the next morning, they were found murdered. That literally happened. Oh, and yeah. It's, and it's like, I, I, I think that he felt guilty. I think that he felt like there, there should have been something that, that he had, she should have done something. He should have intervened somehow. He should have figured out what was going on. And, and because he didn't, he couldn't stand to see these survivors kind of, you know, tarred with whatever. You know, or, or right, whatever. right. He, he didn't want to see that. And, and of course, they were Victorians. None of them wanted to believe that an upper class white lady because they were, Borden was extremely wealthy. He was cheap as hell, but he was really rich. And he left a big estate. And uh, nobody wanted to think that these girls would have done this, you know? And, and Lizzie and Emma, or Lizbeth, she changed her name to Lizbeth. Lizbeth and Emma took that inheritance and they could have gone anywhere once she was exonerated. They could have taken it, they, they were millionaires. They could have literally done whatever they wanted. And instead they bought a house on the other side of town called Maplecroft and lived out their days there. And um, they also, a thing I worked into the sequel uh, was that they had their porch reconfigured so that no one could see into the house and nobody could see the front of the house. And um, also so they could shelter cats. One of the, because yeah. Lizzie, Lizzie never talked to the media. She never talked to the press. She never gave her side of the story. She, she never did. She kept her mouth shut until the day she died. Um, and, and when she died, she left her estate because Emma had died not terribly long before her, like within a year or two, Emma had also died. Um, but she left her entire state humane society out there in Fall River, Massachusetts. She loved cats and, and there were a lot of stray cats and she would take them in and vet them and feed them. And they, they all came and went through that porch that they'd had customized for the house. And that house goes on sale like every two years, like clockwork. And I get a crap ton of email from people going, oh, you should buy it. I am not. No, if I had the money, I would not. <laughs> that is not for me. Thank you. But, That's interesting that it's every two years, though. It's like, it's like every, it's so either, so the B&B, &B, so there's a bed and breakfast from the actual murder house, which was Andrew Borden's house. Right. And it's been turned into a bed and breakfast. And that comes up for sale like every couple, two or three years, too. So about every two years, one of the other will come up for sale. And I just get like my inbox is just flooded with. Oh, that's hilarious. Like, oh, I mean, God. hilarious and kind of creepy. Yeah, but no, no, I don't, I don't want to live in that house. I'm sure it's, it is lovely. I've seen the pictures. <laughs> I've seen the real estate listing. But yeah, no, no thank you. Interesting. Yeah, you'll pass on that. Now, yeah. now it, for something different you did oh, something yeah. different for you with the with the ya uh series well, and it's not really a series they're, they're unrelated oh, well, I'm, I'm, yeah i meant the you, you <laughs> went into the ya uh into the the ya field is what yeah. i meant to say the and then uh what was, what was the impetus for you getting involved uh with writing ya there for uh, a bit so for young adult stuff, um, I had a project that never sold and probably never will. It's okay. Um, but I was shopping around at the time and Scholastic was like, well, look, we'd, we'd like this, but it was science fiction. Like we don't actually sell a lot of science fiction. We license it, but we don't actually publish it. Uh, we kind of don't know what to do with this, but we like the voice. We like your writing. Uh, we have an editor over here who's uh, looking for a writer to develop a project that she wants to do in-house. And, um, and that, that became Princess X. I basically auditioned for the role of the author of Princess X. Ah, um, okay. I'm in effect, which always disappoints kids when I talk to them for schools and stuff like, oh, that wasn't your idea. Well, like all the stuff in it is my idea, but the idea for the book, no, was, was not mine. Um, and then it, it went well. And uh, they asked me for a follow-up, but not a sequel, but something from the same planet that had a comic or an illustrated element alongside the story. 
and we did Agony House. And the Agony House was all mine. That's, so if you hate Agony House, that's entirely my fault. <laughs> oh no I, I thought it was great I, well, like you uh second person plural whoever you are out there in the world um, uh, <laughs> if you hated princess x that ah, wasn't my idea <laughs> so I asked, all right. but if you hated agony house that hurts my little soul because i really loved that one it was entirely mine uh princess x is a modern or is this a contemporary mystery there's not any paranormal elements in it uh, it's a contemporary mystery set in Seattle about a girl who disappeared when she was about 14 and then there uh, there are some signs that maybe she is still alive and under duress somewhere and her best friend has to track all that down um the agony house is way more my wheelhouse to be honest it's a haunted house story set in New Orleans uh which is way more me and my time uh and um also has a lot to do with uh, rehabbing old houses and things, which is also very much my wheelhouse. And um, between the two, I like that one better. But uh, Princess X is the big seller between them. And my editor had left by the time Agony House came out. And uh, it actually burned through two editors. The second editor left right after it came out. Oh, so it kind of, well, you know, well, was, you know it, it was fine. It, you know, it happens in publishing. It's fine. But it, it didn't get the internal push that Princess X did and just kind of didn't do as well. Maybe, maybe it's not as good. I don't know how. <laughs> well, I thought it was good. And one of the, I, there were a couple of things that I particularly appreciated about it. I thought that, um, that you did a really good job with her voice and or with the main character whose name escaped me at this very moment. Crap, it's escaping, um, it's escaping me too. <laughs> Denise. 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 Yeah, D Denise. Danielle, and it wasn't right. Denise, yes. And she, you know, you did a really good job of, uh, you know, coming up with a 17 year old voice because I think there's a tendency sometimes to make them a little too angsty. Um, now, that, right. that's not to say that they're not. I mean, I'm just, or that right. they, you know, but, but, but you can, I think they, you can go down a rabbit hole with the angst and you didn't yeah, do like, that so teenagers are angsty but nobody wants to read too much of that right right and not the teenagers <laughs> either you know i mean not them exactly. either so, and and i did like the way that you worked in some of the um you know the the social repercussions of what had happened right. in new orleans yeah, after yeah. Well, I was still in the south I, I was in in tennessee when katrina happened and and I, i've weathered I, again, I'm from the Gulf Coast of Florida. I've lived on the Gulf Coast of Texas for years as well as a kid. I've probably weathered a couple dozen hurricanes. Uh, you, you hunker down, you wait them out, it's fine. Hey, you pick up some debris out of your yard most of the time. Right. Uh, but but that one, oh boy. And, and, and a lot of the, um, well, frankly, refugees ended up kind of diaspora across the South as they were being evacuated. And so a lot of them actually ended up across Tennessee and Chattanooga. And, and, and I knew a few of them. And it was one of those things where it was like, wow, just, when Katrina happened, it was just such this, this crazy watershed. Everybody was like, how can this be happening in America? And, and it's like, hi, none of the poor people here wonder why this is happening. <laughs> um, right. Like I, I have, I, I was very often when I was a kid, a poor kid, but not the poorest kid. Again, my dad was in the army and and my mom was, was an elementary school teacher. And so like we had stability. It was real low level stability, but I did have right. this much stability, which, which I realized set me apart from a lot of the other kids. And I didn't know what to do with it because I wasn't rich. I didn't have any money, but we could make rent. And, and kind of that weird tension, that, that class tension of being poor, but not the poorest, broke, but not poor would probably be a better way to put it. Um, was was tricky for me and then he ran into gentrification because a lot of the neighborhoods that were so badly hit and, and I, I remember like uh, with the editor with the editors plural and the copy editors about uh, the agony house talking about like well it but it's been like this many years like surely New Orleans is fixed no they haven't there are still FEMA trailer communities now mm. there's still a lot that never got fixed and and these neighborhoods are still struggling in a lot of regard I and mean, they were struggling in the first place and then you drown them <laughs> and then expect them to pop back no. right exactly yeah um and, and I, I i decided to go ahead and try and get a little fiddly with it and i made it a white family a poor white family that had evacuated to houston and had lived there for a while and then dad dies and the, they just call it the storm everybody's mm -hmm. 
Uh, dad dies in the storm, but mom and the kid escape. Mom eventually remarries in Texas and decides she wants to go home. So they buy this, uh, a nail house is kind of the colloquial term when it's the only house left standing on the block. It sticks up like a nail. Right. So they buy a nail house on a block that was destroyed and it's, the house is garbage. It's garbage. But they did buy it and they do own it. And it's garbage. <laughs> but, but that's, <laughs> But that tension, ah, these white people came in and they bought this house in a predominantly black neighborhood. And it's like, well, how do you interface with that? How do you not be a problem when you come in? And there's no easy answer to that. And right. And, and I, yeah, I, I knew there wasn't when I started writing it, but I still felt like it was worth talking about. Oh, yeah. Like, well, it did. And it is. It's a, <laughs> exactly. I mean, it, and I, I think that you handled the conversation really well because you weren't trying to necessarily you you threw out a couple of ideas as to how things could be better but not necessarily saying but this is the way it and has this, to be so and this fixed everything no. exactly exactly <laughs> no no it, it has there not are steps you can take to be part to, to become part of a community rather than driving a community out was how i tried to talk about it and we went through i think i think three sensitivity readers which i, I specific i was like i want a southern woman a, a southern black woman specifically from the south it doesn't necessarily have to be from new orleans but that would be great because it is its own thing but but i don't i don't know what i don't know so somebody like please read this and tell me what i need to fix and um a few fiddly things mostly it was pretty cool Mo mostly i did okay <laughs> but, but obviously i had to change some things i had to fix some things like again i don't know what i don't know and, right. Um, and I, I specifically, there were a couple of people I approached in the first place who, who actually couldn't take the gig. They just had other things going on. But I was like, it was really important to me that Scholastic hated people. Like, if, if I'm going to ask someone to educate me, I don't want to ask them to do that for free. And Scholastic was great about it. Uh, they didn't, there was no hesitation. Yes, we will do that. You got anybody in mind? And then they found some people after my people fell through. And that was just as well, because it's, it's better if it's somebody who doesn't know me and maybe doesn't feel like they have to be gentle with me. <laughs> right, right. Well, that's Tell true. Yeah. Through. Tell me what I screwed up. <laughs> uh, give it, give it uh, to me straight. Uh, it to me straight. I, I would much rather have somebody tell me before it is printed <laughs> and out there in front of God and everybody. Like, no, I, I exactly. I, it, it's not just that I don't want to be offensive or, or hurtful. I, I, I don't. I, I don't want to hurt people. I don't, I don't want to, if there's a better way to do it and I can, I would much prefer to do that. But, but I also feel like I don't want to shy away from the sticky stuff, but right. when you don't know what you don't know, you need help. And I think it's very important to pay your sensitivity readers and, 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 and pay people for their time and their expertise, no matter what it is. And especially with something as, as sensitive and nuanced as that. So gotcha. there. But, but I do like the way Agony House came out. I mean, I like Princess X too, obviously, but, but, but that one wasn't really mine. That one really belonged right. to the editor whose idea it was. And Agony House is mine. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little more protective of that one. <laughs> right, right. Well, I understand. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And speaking of houses. Oh, the family plot. Yeah, yeah. That's a fun one. I love that one. That was oh that was, my goodness. Yeah, well, now I wrote before I left Tennessee again because we are back in Seattle now, and and I really wanted to write a Southern haunted house book so bad. And I lived in this little historic district called St. Elmo. I thought of Chattanooga. We had an older house there that we were kind of fixing up as we went. And um, uh, Family Plot is about a salvage company that's coming in to uh, salvage a house before it's torn down. And I loosely patterned it. So the neighborhood of St. Elmo was at the foot of Lookout Mountain, and it used to be one farm that was subdivided after the war uh, because everybody was broke. <laughs> they sold off everything to try and keep what they had. Um, but the original house uh, was a big fancy Victorian uh, that burned, I want to say, in the 50s. A lot of things burned down in the 50s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, interesting, isn't it? A lot of things did. Well, no, I don't think it's complicated. I think it comes down to knob and tube wiring. Mm, uh, yeah. Knob and tube wiring and gas fixtures, I think, between them. Yeah, what are you gonna do? Uh, but I kind of loosely, it was loosely inspired by the original house. It was on this huge lot in St. Elmo. And um, that was that was fun. 
Um, there's a TV show on, I think it's DIY Network, now I forget, um, called Black Dog Salvage, about a company in Roanoke, Virginia. They salvage his old houses and they salvage all this stuff. And I hate seeing old things torn down. I want to save all of it. But sometimes you can't. And they right. in and they take out what they can. They, they salvage what they can. They restore what they can. And they repurpose it and resell it. And that's extremely useful for like people with old houses. We're trying to get doors of a weird size or tiles in just this right pattern or whatever. And the tile thing is actually like really specific because uh, your fireplace tiles or your whatever tiles, there was usually some dude on site who just mixed it all up and did it there. Those are mostly custom done house to house. Right, it's right. Really hard to match that stuff. But you, but the colors were pretty consistent. You can kind of get close matches. I got a bag of tiles for six bucks at a salvage store that were so close to what we were missing from one of our fireplaces. Literally nobody ever noticed once I put them in. But uh, anyway, I, I drunkenly one night while my husband was out of town uh, was watching Salvage Dogs. And at the end of Salvage Dogs, there's this like, you know, oh, the credits. And at the very bottom, it's like, contact us here. Yeah, you got something to say about Salvage Dogs? You want to respond to our TV show? Got any questions or comments? I'm like, oh, I do. <laughs> so on my phone, I'm a little drunk, because they had a contact form. It wasn't sending them an email. So I'm sending them a contact form through their website. It's like, oh, hi, my name is Sherry. I'm a writer. I'm writing a book about a haunted house. And it's being cleaned up by a salvage company. And I watch you guys all the time. But I have a handful of really specific questions that aren't answered by anything on your show that I've seen so far. Could I just like, talk to somebody for like half an hour. I promise my questions are very specific. I'm not going to just be like, how do you start the salvage company? You know, it, uh, where do you get your ideas? Yeah. <laughs> none of that. I have very specific questions that I cannot Google my way to. Can you help me? So the next day I've completely forgotten about it. <laughs> and I check my email. Lo and behold, <laughs> the general manager of the store has responded. And he was great. He was just like, so usually he's like, I, ch I check this email, this, this contact form like once a week. And I have a link right here to let me Google that for you because it's always, how do I start my own salvage company? And I just send them a, let me Google that for you link. He's like, no one has ever asked me this before. Um, here's what my lunch break is. Here's my phone number. Give me a call. And it was awesome. I ended up talking to the guy for like an hour because we got nerdy about old houses. But when we first got, I'm like, okay, so. And I gave him the parameters of the estate. And like, so this much, this many, this kind. Would you need two 16 foot trucks or would you bring an 18 in? And what, what about the dually trailers? Because if you have two of those, and it, again, if they're like the, the eight or nine foot or the 14 foot, then how right. many do you would need for this and this and this and this? And, this? and when I finally stopped talking, he's like, that has been fact a very specific question. <laughs> You said, well, I warned you. <laughs> I, did, I did tell you, I have very specific questions. I needed to know, like, how many trucks? Like, how many this? How many that? And, and I was like, and, and I want to ask about, like, do people just kind of go, do you want to pick this building? Or, or do you have, like, a list? Do you walk in, like, we want that and that and that, and you write it down? And then you, like, like do you pay piecemeal? Do you just, like, pay a flat rate for an estate? What do you do? But the guy was super, super great. He was super, I sent him a signed copy of the book, of course, uh, when all was said and done. <laughs> and uh, and then he, but apparently he'd left the, the company by then. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> but one of the other guys got it and then added me on Twitter. So I'm like, yay, they got my book. <laughs> but, That's uh, awesome. That was a fun one to do. So that was, that was probably one of my favorites to write. And I read it right before we came back to Seattle. It was published right before we came back to Seattle. And so I wrote in some of my own neighbors. And there's like a basset hound who appears at a coffee shop and he belonged to a neighbor of ours. <laughs> like, oh, okay. Yeah. In, you know, for, for fun. It was a great little neighborhood and I, and I miss it. I really like living there. But. Well, it's a very compelling book. And I, I actually hadn't thought about that much about uh, what the whole salvage uh, business yeah, would have been it's like it's in that great. situation. So it was very interesting. interesting. And, and I love that stuff. And I love and Like I have an old house again. Um, our present place was built in 1900. It was actually moved to this lot in the 60s, uh, but it is an older home, and and I love older houses, and I'm just a total nerd for them, and it just really made sense to go ahead and do my haunted to house. do that. Yeah. yeah. Well, now we have this one. We're back in Florida. Back in Florida, in Casadega. Yeah, it's a yes. spiritual community. 
in a, a little outside of um, Orlando Stanford and my cousin lives near there so I just took a field trip and went and crashed with my cousin Jackie the same Jackie from the earlier story <laughs> oh okay <laughs> Lord for those different heroes that the same Jackie lives out near there and I stayed with her for a few days and we came and went from Deltona and it was honestly a really good time and I told her because Jackie has never been especially religious and their mom was not quite as mm, as my mom um, but but we had that conversation. Like, I was like, listen, you know, if you don't if you don't want to do this tour, if you don't want to hang out with me, I understand. I'm not mad about it. Um, but you're welcome to join me. And she was super close. Like, no, I want to check this out. Let's go. Yeah, but isn't that when you've, you've got the real community? You had it based on a real community. You've yep. got uh, and you've got your uh, your psychics and your ghosts and your little bit of everything. So uh, you know, it fits right in. Now, a one I can't hold up and and uh say anything about it because i have an e-copy is the toll oh the toll you have a new one yeah yeah the most <laughs> recent yeah and uh yeah and so that one um was again that that I, that one i think of as being kind of emerging of some of your earlier <laughs> stuff with with your more recent stuff so well, when, Liz, uh, it's, when Liz got the draft of that, the first draft of it was honestly a mess, and and her response to it, and I want I want to be clear, I'm not like mad about this. She was totally right. It was like this feels like a mixtape of some of your favorite kinds of characters and scenarios, <laughs> but I'm not sure there's a story here. <laughs> so we went through several drafts on that, and and she she wasn't wrong even a little bit. Uh, the problem was I, I ended up writing. So she left. Uh, she left tour kind of in the middle of that book and then the book was orphaned for like six months and then I got a new editor Beth Meacham who was fantastic honestly and um that was great but it was still like there's this long you know kind of gap between working on it and come back to so I'm like crap what was I doing on this I don't even remember and uh but, but between Liz and Beth we finally got it beaten into shape and sent out the door but then uh Beth had um i want to say eye surgery and she's now retired so she left and then there was nobody dealing with a the book then and it was just kind of like when was it actually it was like two years late <laughs> oh my gosh and it finally came out and I, I i was never really sure how to feel about it because we'd done so many drafts and i'd been so uncertain about the first round but but it was actually really well received and and i'm delighted um there's a there's not an urban legend but a rural legend about the okefenokee swamp on uh, state road 70 or if you cross it going east to west or west, I forget which is which, honestly, now it's been a minute. Uh, but the idea being like, if you go this way, you cross six bridges. And if you go this way, you will you might cross seven, but you'd better hope not. You better um, hope not. Yeah. Well, that will happen if you do. But I was like, that'll be fun to write about. Well, let's talk about that then. Oh, well, the Carl at the bar is based on Carl Epperson, who passed away before I wrote the book. And I wanted to include him. Oh, okay. 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 He's the same Carl. Um, he's also in the Eden books. In the first, he's with Carl and Cowboy. Um, the 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 Native American vet who has the service dog named Cowboy. Oh, okay. Um, gotcha. Yeah. That's that's Carl. So he was a real person. He used to run for mayor of Chattanooga every now and again for shifts and giggles. This tremendous human being who who I adored beyond belief, and and he passed away while we were still living there a couple years before we left and um, i've decided that carl must appear as a ghost in everything i do henceforth. oh well, there you go carl's got to be a ghost in everything i still have a rose from his funeral actually in this house i brought it with me out back west so it's, it's in our kitchen in a little bug face but well that. we were coming back from florida recently and when i saw we didn't cut we didn't get that close to the oki <laughs> but it was right after i had well no i actually finished reading the toll while we were on the trip and but it was on yeah it was on the way back and i'm thinking well let's not go on this route 177 yeah, whatever yeah. we do so uh i was telling my husband about that because he he really wants to go there but now to, <laughs> yeah exactly i'm sure yeah i'm sure that's the best place especially oh, on that one road well, uh, doesn't exist. I made up that town, so you can't stay in Stillwater. Right, right. I I was hoping that that was true, and I actually looked on the map. Yeah, he was asking me that before we left. He was like, because I was reading it, you know, before we left, and he said, "So, um, you know, is the town the town real?" I said, "I don't think so." And then when I was in the car, I'm looking on the map. I'm like, "Oh, thank Porto goodness. isn't either, 
but I did base Fordo. So when I first moved to Tennessee years and years ago, people would talk about going south to Fordo. And I didn't know what Fort, Fordo is short for Fort Oglethorpe. <laughs> oh, okay. I, gotcha. I yeah. thought there was a little town called Porto somewhere south of Chattanooga. I had no idea. So I just moved Fordo because <laughs> I thought it'd be funny. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is good. Yeah. Funny. Well, now as, as we kind of wind our things down here before we, before we leave, I, I wanted to ask you about some things that you have uh, coming up. And uh, one of them I do know about. Oh, That's the Grave this Reservations. One. Yes. Yeah. Grave Reservations, which is so much fun. <laughs> Thank you. And it was I. Fun to write. What's it, that? It was really fun to write. Oh, yeah. I bet. Yeah. And what what's your what can you tell people about that one? I, I'm not going to, I don't want to give anything away, but. <laughs> Uh, no, there's a, a psychic travel agent teaming up with a Seattle uh, homicide detective to, they fight crime. Uh, <laughs> no, so true story. I'll try to keep it short. I know it's been like an hour and a half at this point. Uh, uh, sorry. I, again, I work from home by myself. And it's like people to talk to. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> I'm a Leo. It's what we do. Uh, no, so in really real life, a handful of years ago, I was at an event in Texas. I was in Galveston. And it was a good event. Good time. Hurrah. Um, and it was in January, I'm pretty sure. And uh, there was a storm coming up through the Gulf. So when the convention is ending, everybody's bolting because it's like an hour and a half, whatever, to Houston airport from Galveston. And everybody is desperately trying to get out ahead of the storm that is coming up. And everybody right. knows it's not a hurricane, it's winter, it's wrong season. But um, it was going to dump a bunch of snow going to tear up roads, it's going to make a whole mess all the way through the southeast, and everybody's just trying to get home. <sighs> and it, anyway, so I'm leaving the event, I'm in the car that's taking me back to the airport, and because uh, the event arranged all my travel, which is nice, they don't always, but this, this, this event did, and I get this text, Doo -doo -doo. hi, my name is, and I don't remember not being cute, I literally don't remember this woman's name, and I wish I did, I would love to credit her. I'm your travel agent. Um, I was hoping to catch you before you left the hotel, but uh, clearly I haven't. Um, I have changed your flight. I had a bad feeling about the one you were going out on and uh, I just changed it. Uh, don't worry, it, uh, your new flight, it leaves like the next gate over 30 minutes after your first flight left. I just, I feel better about this one. Here's your new confirmation, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, okay, I guess. All right, it's 30 minutes. It's like, whatever. Yeah. Cool. Uh, <laughs> you know, you've built me in some wiggle room. That's, that's fine. I'm always early anyway for flying. I'm really neurotic about it. I've got to be there early and checked in. I would rather be early and then just relax and take my time than rushing up through the end. My husband is the rusher. That's, it drives me insane. We don't travel much together. Um, but anyway, I'm like, okay, so I get to the airport. There is a line of 127 people. I had time to count around the lobby of the Houston airport because the American airline counters are down. And of course I'm flying out on American. And uh, I'm like, well, shit. Um, and while I'm standing there, I just kind of text this nice lady. I'm like, hey, listen, thanks. <laughs> but a half hour ain't gonna cut it. I don't think I'm leaving Texas tonight. And again, grew up in Texas, no big whip. I got friends in the Houston area. I'll right, right. If worse I'll comes to worse. Yeah. I'll crash on some couches, no big thing. So I get this immediate message back, like, use the kiosk. And I'm like, I don't see any kiosks. And, and she tells me exactly where they are. They're kind of around a corner, around a bend, sort of. And I'm like, okay. Uh, they don't work. They're roped off. There's no one over there. And she just sends back, nobody's using them because nobody's using them. Go try. Okay, so by this time I'm friendly with a lady in line behind me. I'm very shy. <laughs> she was like, okay, here's the deal. You go check it out. If it works, you come back, you tell me, and I'll go do it. And then we tell all the rest of these people. I'm like, right. <laughs> sure enough, we're fine. I don't know why they were roped off, especially not with a counter down. I have no clue, but it worked. I check in bolt through security which is empty because everybody's stuck in the lobby and i passed the first gate and in fact the flight has been canceled i'm like 
well played travel agent lady nice to yeah you. really get and to so my gate uh flights delayed 45 minutes and i'm like <laughs> you're like well, we, all know, we all know that's the first step to it being canceled when they keep delaying it and i'm like shit i don't think i'm wrong. and i'm about to text her and she texts back Bloop. how close are you to nashville she means from Chattanooga, which is where I was going right. back. And I see where she's going with this. And I'm like, I'm actually closer to Atlanta. Because I was like right on the Georgia line in St. Elmo. I would walk my dog to Georgia. Like, I'm much closer to Hartsfield. If you can get me to Hartsfield, I can just rent a car and drive home. I've done it before. It's no big deal. And she goes, no, no, you're not going to make it home tonight if you do that. You won't get home until tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to try and get you home tonight. I'm going to get you home tonight. Hang on. So few minutes later uh, when she asked me if, I, if there was somebody who could pick me up in Atlanta if I couldn't make a connecting flight to Chatty because the problem with the Hartsfield is is that they um offload all their scheduling issues to the little regional airports around it so they're the, the first flights delayed the first flights canceled to make room for the big flights and the big cities coming in and I knew this going in which is why I said I'll just rent a car don't try to book me for Chattanooga and um so I asked my husband I'm like, I'm really sorry I hate to ask you. I know it's like a three hour round trip, but can you come pick me up in Atlanta? And he was super cool. He's like, yeah, oh, all right, here we go. He's got, we got, we had an SUV and I'm like, you know, if we get caught in the snow, we'll be okay. And um, so that's what happened. So he picks me up. We get back to Chatty. As we pull up next to my house, uh, the, it was like 11.58 PM at this point. And there was a thermometer on the dash. Uh, and it clicked over to 32 degrees and it started to snow. Like as we pull up the house. Oh my gosh. Holy shit. Technically <laughs> I made it home tonight. And so I, um, the next day I, I sent her, I wanted to give her a follow-up and say, thank you. You know, I'm like, hey, I just wanted to say, um, thank you so much. You actually did get me home <laughs> that day. Uh, that, that was really cool. It's almost like you're psychic or something. And her response was, oh, ha, ha, ha. Um, that's actually my, my side hustle. Uh, <laughs> she's like, I've been working with the Houston Police Department for like 20 years. I've helped them close like a dozen cases. And I'm like, oh, you're a psychic travel agent? <laughs> that's the greatest thing I've ever heard. I was like, lady, I'm using this in a book. I need for you to know that. And she's like, help yourself. Have a good time. Um, and oh, that's kind of awesome. Because I didn't start writing that for like another four years. It was it was easily four or five years before I started writing great reservations after that because we were in Seattle by the time I was I was working on that. And there there I want to say is, but maybe used to be, I don't know, um a, a, an an import export business in downtown Seattle called Far Fetched. And every time we drove past it, I thought, man, that's a fun name. Think yeah, that is a cool name. But think of all the things that could be if it wasn't an import business. It could be like, <gasps> it could be a travel agency. That's right. It's kind of like, boom, far fetched. And the original title of the book actually was Far Fetched. And, um, it, but then, so we sold it to Atria uh, 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 from Simon and Schuster. And uh, they, um, it, it, they were interested in changing the title. They're like, you know, with a hyphen, sometimes it's hard for people to search. Sometimes people get it wrong. Depending on your search mechanism, it may not pop up correctly. So let's try and do something without a hyphen. And we went back and forth for a while with a bunch of travel puns and whatnot and uh, settled on grave reservations. And I feel good about it. And the working title for the sequel, which I'm working on right now, is Flight Risk, but I don't know if we're going to keep it or not. Um, titles change a lot. It's fine. Right, right. Well, I was going to ask if there was uh, if there was more coming, but uh, One more so coming. you heard it. <laughs> people will <laughs> hear it here yeah. uh, there's one more and and grave reservations is slated for right around halloween so right yes the next one will be as well um but yeah it, it's it's so so in the book at least this travel agent who, who is much younger than i assumed this woman was if she's been doing that for 20 years she had to at least be in her 40s or 50s um, I, I would assume uh but uh lita i've, I've gone ahead and made a millennial because they're fun and, and <laughs> like millennials got i mean gen x i'm gen x you know boy we got a short stick they got an even shorter stick than we did uh, yeah. and 
and so I've, I've made her in, in her mid thirties and, um, but I've already, already gotten some good feedback from other millennials. Like she doesn't sound like a flaky dumbass. Thank you. Well, no, they're like normal people. They're right. Right. Like, people are, are when it comes down to it, economy, you know, but she started her own travel agency and, and, um, you know, the cold open is basically there's a cop who was sent to a convention in Orlando and she changes the slide at the last second because she has a bad feeling and he's big mad about it. Uh, and then he watches the plane blow up on the tarmac and uh, realizes that she knows something he doesn't. So he has this one last case that haunted him all these years that he wants help on. And, and so he's willing to try anything. So he shows up at her office and asks her to help. And um, so, yeah. And, and, and we'll see what happens there. And uh, the next book, uh, like I said, tentatively, it's called Flight Risk. I don't know what the actual pub title will be, but uh, it opens with Grady and his daughter out at uh, Rainier National Park, the mountain. Oh, yeah, yeah. The mountain out there. Uh, they've lost their dog, Cairo. Oh, no. Who, who they found in a Target parking lot. Right. Yeah. Uh, but, but he got a leash and took off because you, you can only have dogs in certain places at the park. Uh, he, he's been missing for days. They're handing out flyers. They're desperate to find their dog. But it's a me book. You know the dog is okay. I'm just right, kidding. right. The dog uh, will be okay. Yeah. The dog is fine. So he comes, uh, he comes running up a trail with something in his mouth. And it is a leg. <laughs> of and course. It but, is a book by you, after all. <laughs> Cairo has, it, 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 she named him Cairo after a beanie baby she had when she was like 12. So, so the dog's name is Cairo. Because he's a he's a yellow he was the same color of the beanie baby lion that she had, that the kid had, and uh, so they find their dog and then instant new mystery for everybody to go chasing. How because they don't know where the rest of the body is. The dog's been right, missing. right. They got to figure out where the rest of it came the from. Dog's yeah. been missing for three days. Who knows how far he wandered? Who knows where he went and what he did? And they got to stalk his poop because they think he ate something. So they're like going to his dog. Oh, oh gotcha. Yeah. Oh my I, goodness. I, 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 like you know checked for evidence and, and all that but it, it, it's this too is fun to write as it turns out I, I just kind of felt like maybe the world was dark enough right now right and uh, that was like I started writing Grave Reservations at this point it's been like two years ago so we're kind of in the middle of maybe a dark time in America I didn't even know there was a pandemic coming but, right. but it was dark enough already dark enough that. before yeah well, it's perfect. It, I, you know, I think people are going to love it. Well, thank you. I hope so. It was it, it's delightful to do, and I love the characters. It's so much fun, and and I try to have like a fun side cast, you know. And uh, everybody at the bar. Oh, she does a uh, site. Uh, well, they call it the psychic songstress, but she calls it clairvoyant karaoke. Right. And she, and she basically she kind of hones her skills at this uh, dive bar called Castaways on Capitol Hill where uh she does karaoke but she like uh psychometry where she takes an object and holds it and then picks a song and uh and she's kind of building up her skills a little bit that way to to tremendous hilarity from the people who work there right right <laughs> yeah and, and it's a, it's a, it's a fun book i mean despite this the seriousness of so oh yeah and matter <laughs> you know yeah it, it's, it is a fun book and i i think that uh, I think that, I think your readers are going to enjoy it, and I think you're going to pick up some new ones. To be absolutely well, honest with you, so your lips to God's ears, as they say. That's right. Well, we will, uh, you know, look forward to um, when it's when it's out in the world. And in the meantime, I'm going to hold on to my copy very <laughs> carefully. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. You and, always get copies forever, Carol. Anything oh well, thank you. You can have an arc. I'm serious. Uh, <laughs> Thank it's you very like much. You. <laughs> uh, you're you're very kind. But I I want to thank you so much for being here tonight, Sherry. It's oh, it's great to see you. It's been way I too long. I know. I'm so sorry, and it's so good to see you too. And I'm so, I, like it's been like an hour and forty five minutes at this point. Yeah. But um, <laughs> but I'm just so happy to talk to you. That's all it is. Thank you so much. Well, you are so welcome, and maybe we will do this again, and hopefully. Uh, you mean, I mean, I would be happy to do, we can, we can do a part two at some point, but I, but I, I look forward to seeing you in person. Likewise. True joy. So, uh, and I, I, I want to thank uh, all of our viewers. Uh, I want to tell everybody that uh, we appreciate you watching and to make sure you get a copy of Grave Reservations on Pre-order. Yeah, October's, uh, what does it say? 
I don't know. It's right 26. Twenty-six. Just in time for Halloween. And it's a fun read and it's it's engrossing. I think people will really enjoy it. So again, Sherry, thank you so very much. I really appreciate it. And uh, we will uh, look forward we'll to seeing you there. in person in Dragon Con. <laughs> thank and, you. I'm going to yes. do everything I can to be there. Thank you. That would be wonderful. We will we will be uh, you know waiting and hoping and fingers crossed and uh, you. you know we will we will see you in person then. And uh, in the meantime, everybody from Dragon Con or anybody else who happens to watch this on our YouTube channel, thank you and uh, enjoy Sherry's books and enjoy coming to Dragon Con as well. Thanks so much, everyone.